For the life of me, I don't know why landlords make it so hard to have assistance animals like my dog, Alex. My last apartment, the building manager was a real problem. When you have access to so much information, you have the responsibility to be very careful how you use the information and share that information with clients in the MLS. Hello, I'm Sandra Ortiz. Welcome to this edition of Housing Point. Today, we'll be discussing the Fair Housing Act in honor of its 50th anniversary in 2018. President Lyndon B. Johnson signed the Fair Housing Act on April 11, 1968, just days after Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. Dr. King was the country's most notable proponent of fair housing, marching in the streets of Chicago in 1966 to end the years of housing discrimination experienced in communities across the country. The act currently prohibits discrimination concerning the sale, rental, and financing of housing based on race, color, religion, sex, disability, familial status, and national origin. In honor of the 50-year milestone, we'll address ways that the Fair Housing Act protects real estate professionals and your customers, and to help you navigate your responsibilities under the act. We'll also look at how the Fair Housing Act addresses harassment and retaliation in the housing context. Finally, we'll review the best practices for criminal background checks of housing applicants. Our first story profiles a veteran who has an emotional disability and wants his assistance animal to live with him. Many landlords still aren't familiar with the Fair Housing Act's requirement that housing providers accommodate tenants who require assistance animals. Horace Miller reports from Chicago. Philip, a Marine veteran, is joining me today along with his assistance animal, Alex. Philip and Alex have been a team for six years. After serving tours in Iraq and Afghanistan, Philip was wounded and developed post-traumatic stress. Now Alex helps him get through some very difficult days and nights. Uh, Alex is a part of me. I really can't imagine life without him. Somehow, he always knows when I'm having a bad time. Like last night. He woke me up so I didn't start having a nightmare. And before Alex, I would wake up thinking I was in the middle of a firefight. Not anymore. He's the one thing that keeps me calm. And your doctor suggested you benefit from an assistance animal like Alex? Correct. My VA doctors have eliminated most of the medications I used to take since I started using an assistance animal. Uh, one of my doctors even said, my dog is the best medicine for me. But try telling that to some of these landlords. Landlords and building management need to be aware of the law. They are required to accommodate people with physical or mental disabilities and permit them to have an assistance animal, even when a building has a no pets rule. If a tenant with a disability makes a request for an exception to the rule, building management must accommodate them. Unless there is a threat to the health and safety of others, the housing provider should consider and grant the request. Any animal that provides a disability-related service to the disabled can be considered an assistance animal, even monkeys, birds, or reptiles. Your building has a no pets rule. So what did you do to support your request for an exception? Well, since my disability is post-traumatic stress, which isn't something you can see, I provided management with a letter from my VA doctor. Now the letter explains that I have a disability and then Alex provides me with disability-related assistance. Well, that should be all you need to have your animal live with you, right? You would think so, but then the landlord wanted to know what my disability was, what medication I was taking, and some other health-related information, which I didn't think was any of their business. According to the Fair Housing Act, housing providers and real estate professionals are not allowed to ask for information regarding medications, copies of medical records, or any details about the nature or severity of a person's disability. A letter from a doctor detailing the patient's need for an assistance animal should be all it takes to allow for an exception to any no pets rule. Of course, there are some people who try to exploit this right and fake documents can be obtained from uncredible sources. If you suspect that documents are not credible, make a written record and advise the property owner of your concerns. Then have them advise you regarding next steps. 
For more information about the accommodation for assistance animals, visit fairhousing.realtor. Our next story concerns a mom who not only had to deal with harassment and retaliation from her landlord, but also another problem, discrimination against families with children, a protected class under the Fair Housing Act. Anne is a divorced mother living with her nine-year-old daughter, Casey. She thought she had found the perfect apartment for the two of them. But soon after moving in, the landlord began to harass her. When she reported his inappropriate behavior, he retaliated by shutting off her water. At first, he seemed really friendly, going out of his way to see if I needed anything. But then it became uncomfortable, and I complained. The next day, I went to give my daughter a bath, and the water had been shut off. And when I called my landlord about the problem, he wouldn't return my calls. Under the Fair Housing Act, just a single incident of harassment, such as a demand for sexual favors, may be enough evidence to constitute a hostile living environment. The Fair Housing Act also prohibits retaliation against anyone who reports a discriminatory housing practice. Now Ann wants to find a different one-bedroom apartment for herself and her daughter, but she's running into something else landlords who don't want to rent to her because she has a child living with her. First, I had to deal with management companies that don't want to rent to families who have kids. Is it against the law for them to even ask if you have children? Well, they have ways of finding out. Social media, for instance. And usually they'll ask the ages of everyone in the family on those applications that you have to fill out. Or they will ask you, so how old are your kids? Out of the blue, and then before you know it, you're answering without even thinking and then suddenly they don't have any apartments available to rent right now, or ever. So that's why I only give our names. And um, sometimes landlords will actually say in their ads that they're renting to adults only, or they will imply that they don't want kids. Familiar status is a protected class under the Fair Housing Act, making it unlawful for housing providers to deny housing outright because a family has children living with them under the age of 18. These same protections apply to families who are expecting or adopting children. Additionally, housing providers may not restrict families with children to live in certain areas of the building complex or refuse to let them use certain facilities. There are exceptions, including certain types of housing designed just for people 55 years or older. But for the majority of people looking for a place to live, the ages of their family members should have no bearing on their ability to find a home. My family's just my daughter and me, so I want to rent a one-bedroom because I'm on a limited budget. But even though there are buildings that allow kids, I was told that I have to rent a two-bedroom because there are two people in my family. But I'm sure they must allow people who are roommates get a one-bedroom. And what about people who are married? Exactly what my broker said. Amazing how easy it was to get a one-bedroom when she brought that up and made it clear that we knew the law. To learn more about the Fair Housing Act's protections against harassment, retaliation, and discrimination against families with children, visit fairhousing.realtor. Our final fair housing story is about big data and its link to steering. I don't have to tell you big data is everywhere. It's in your pocket, it's in your wallet, your house, your car, and of course, on social media. Big data helps you offer enhanced service to your prospects but it can also lead to accusations of steering. Horace Miller reports from San Jose, California. In real estate, data about properties and customers is readily available, and what used to take months to collect, organize, and analyze now takes only minutes or even seconds, and it seems to grow exponentially every day. There are even a number of services that aggregate all the data for a property to make it useful for a single housing transaction. So what kind of information is available to you? Well, before you even meet or speak to a client, you can learn their race, color, country of origin, disability, sexual orientation, familial status, and religion without much searching. But that same information can also be used to discriminate. Interesting. How so? Well, with so much data available about a prospect, you have to be extra careful not to use that information in a discriminatory manner. 
You also have to be very careful to avoid steering. So steering is when a real estate professional guides a prospect to or away from a particular community or a type of housing based on their race, ethnicity, or another protected class. In every instance, we are always obligated to provide our clients with equal professional services. So what's the best way to avoid this? Use the equal professional service model. Ask yourself, do I have objective information from my customer about the kind of house that they want to buy? Have I let my customer set the limits on the size of the house and its location? Have I offered them a variety of homes to choose from based on their preferences? So what about brokers who run ads for their houses on social media? Well, before you write anything, you want to be very careful not to target ads to or away from protected classes. Otherwise, you could get into trouble for steering. When you write an ad for a house, you want to describe the property by highlighting the positives of the housing, not the ethnic makeup of the neighborhood or desired characteristics of a potential buyer. How about when you're meeting with clients face to face? Well, you want to ask the customer about their needs. Size, style, features of a home, types of schools, convenient transportation, where they can shop. You know, you want to avoid questions about their religion or ethnic background. And remember, you're there to help them find a home based on their individual preferences, not yours. So what if someone wants to know about the quality of the schools in the area? Well, you want to avoid making a value judgment about the quality of schools. Even with all the data that we have, opinions on schools' quality can be very subjective. Instead, maybe refer a potential buyer to the website of the school district so that they can do their own research based on their needs. You want to let the client set their own limits. You must get a lot of questions about the crime rates and the demographics of different neighborhoods. You want to avoid discussing crime rates or the demographics of the people in an area. If a client wants to know about demographics in the area, direct them to the Census Bureau website. Don't discuss the race or the religion of people who live in the neighborhood. And same with questions about crime rate. I always suggest that they talk to the local police or go to the library or use the internet so that they can find the facts. A broker should never say that one area is safer than another. So you suggest giving a client the tools to find their own information and make their own judgments. Well, in the end, I think that's more helpful. And also, by offering a variety of choices, you avoid unwittingly excluding property that the customer might like. In the end, it's up to the client. If you are pressed by a client for your opinion, always be professional. The more subjective a question is, the more risk there is to give an inappropriate or even unlawful answer. Ask them what their concerns are, and then refer them to the appropriate sources of information. You want to avoid making judgments, offering opinions, and sharing your perceptions. Tell a client it's your policy to help them make their own decisions. So even with an abundance of data at your fingertips, remember that any decision should always be left to the client. It's best for them, and then you can avoid trouble with the Fair Housing Act. For more information on big data and how to avoid steering, visit fairhousing.realtor. Horace Miller joins me now via satellite to discuss criminal background checks. So Horace, what have you learned in your travels around the country? Well, Sandra, the criminal background check issue poses a pretty daunting problem for people with a criminal history, as some individuals still seem to have trouble getting an application approved to rent an apartment. That doesn't seem fair. It's more than not fair. In some instances, it can be illegal. How should real estate professionals handle these situations? Landlords should implement a written policy for criminal background checks of housing applicants and apply that policy consistently to every applicant. A written policy gets everyone on the same page. It makes clear that the same standards apply to everyone. And it should be crafted with the safety and protection of all residents and property in mind. At the same time, it's against the fair housing laws for management companies to have a blanket ban on anybody who has a conviction. So what kind of information should a housing provider be looking for when formulating a policy? A landlord should allow an individual to provide additional information and should consider a number of factors when evaluating a housing applicant's criminal history. For instance, how long ago was the conviction? Five years? Ten years? Avoid looking back indefinitely into a person's criminal history. How old were they? 
Were there any extenuating or mitigating circumstances? Have they been through a successful rehab? Was the crime a misdemeanor or a felony? Was it violent or nonviolent? And a housing provider should never consider arrests as part of the applicant's criminal history. To sum up, real estate professionals and management companies have to weigh the protection of the residents and property as they evaluate someone with a past conviction. A good policy helps those who have paid their debt to society find a place to live. Thanks for the excellent report, Horace. Thank you. For more information about criminal background checks, visit fairhousing.realtor. The National Association of Realtors has set an exemplary standard for equality in housing, which its members are obligated to uphold. In fact, NAR's Code of Ethics goes beyond the federal fair housing law and some state laws by prohibiting discrimination by its members based on sexual orientation or gender identity. And Realtors do not take their responsibility lightly. Even when a state law does not prohibit discrimination against a client that is a member of the LGBT community, a broker's participation in such discrimination would run against their ethical obligations under NAR's Code of Ethics. As a leading advocate for fair housing, the National Association of Realtors has taken a clear stance that everyone deserves the equal right to purchase or reside in the home of their choice without regard to sexual orientation or gender identity. Each of NAR's 1.2 million members have made a commitment to upholding this ideal. 2018 marks the first 50 years of this groundbreaking legislation, which gave everyone the right to be in the housing of their choice. We leave the next 50 years in your capable hands.